Right. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for that introduction, Dave. Dave said that uh, I don't know if uh, most of you were probably saw Richard's uh, last uh, excellent session, so I don't know that I've got much to add. In fact, I might have to take some slides out because I think they were wrong. But <laughs> So anyway, welcome. Uh, Dave said that he picked these topics because that's what he wanted to know about. So if you get overdone with facial trauma, then uh, you've got him to blame. So uh, Dave's already given this introduction. I always feel like I have to say I'm an Otago graduate because there's only a few of us around and, you know, it's like an AA meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, I did some fellowships overseas and then was in Waikato for a few years and now I've uh, been in Auckland for a few years. So it's interesting actually from a facial trauma point of view, uh, I'm sure Richard agrees that it's very uh, country and locality specific. So for example in, in Asia, uh, I almost never saw any trauma from interpersonal violence, you know, punching and fists and things. It's all uh, related to scooters and motorbikes and, you know, falling off. Whereas Waikato, you know, um, any Waikato people here? I better be careful. Oh, Tarun's there. Uh, so a lot of animal-related injuries, you know, getting kicked by horses and cows and um, that sort of thing. And Middlemore, obviously, um, I don't have to tell you what sort of uh, things we get. So those are my interests, uh, mostly head and neck type things. Um, okay, so we'll move on, and I, I just wanted to give you, uh, firstly, because my brief is, is facial trauma generally, uh, just, a, just an overview of what, you know, how to approach facial trauma, because, you know, sure, it's, it's easy to talk about specific patterns of trauma, but, um, but how you approach a patient that you might come across, and most of you will be coming across them as the first responder, or at least the first medical person who sees them. So. There's the, there's the emergency care, which is what's important in the first few minutes, obviously, and, and the early care, so how do you manage them in the first few hours, first few days, and then the late reconstruction, which I won't really go into, but um, there, there's a lot to do. You know, uh, often we do what we can in the early situation, and there's a lot of secondary reconstruction that's sometimes uh, required as well. Okay, so as far as emergency care is concerned, it'll be no surprise to you guys that, uh, that it's the ABCs and, um, and, you know, sometimes you do come across some pretty horrific facial injuries. Uh, so your first priority, particularly if it's a maxillomandibular type injury, is the airway. Um, now, um, some of you will have access to ET tubes and intubation, etc., cetera, and, um, you know, we'll be able to do this. But uh, quite often in the emergency department, uh, intubation or sometimes tracheostomy is really the only way to control the airway. But I'll give you some other tips before that. Um, second priority is bleeding, so control hemorrhage. Sometimes facial hemorrhage can be quite significant and, and life-threatening, particularly with mid-face uh, trauma, maxillary trauma. You can have some really life-threatening trauma, and it's probably the most you know, some of the scariest uh, bleeding I've ever seen is, you know, blood welling out of every orifice in the face. It's um, natural and unnatural orifices. And then always remember in the back of your mind that every patient with facial trauma will, at least 30% of patients uh, uh, with facial trauma will have something else going on. So they'll either have concussion, head injury, uh, they might have eye uh, trauma, so I'm talking about ocular specific injury rather than orbital uh, floor injury, uh, and, and they will, they're uh, at high risk of cervical spine injury. So you need to keep those things in mind, particularly if they're not uh, completely conscious. Um, you know, occult cervical spine injuries uh, supposedly are up to 20% of, of uh, zygomatic fractures. So, you know, just keep those things in mind. Okay, so this is your emergency airway management. Uh, the patients that will have lost their airway or whose airway will be threatened will uh, often have a loose mandible. As you know, mandibular fractures tend to be, uh, don't tend to be just one side, they tend to be bilateral. Uh, so often they'll have a loose mandible. So quite often you can control their airway quite easily with just the jaw thrust, chin lift, maybe a, a Goodell airway will, will, will usually do the trick. Uh, sometimes if there's a lot of bleeding or, or uh, upper airway secretions or vomiting associated with that, lateral positioning is quite important. Uh, and then obviously, you know, you go down the list there, which is probably, um, you know, hopefully you'll, you won't ever have to do these, but awake intubation, laryngeal mask, crocothyroidotomy, which is obviously a skill that we should all know. And always remember that in that, in that process, you should always keep in mind the cervical spine uh, potential for injury. Hemorrhage control, um, has anyone seen serious facial bleeding that's really scary? 
Um, I'm sure Richard has. Uh, so it, it can be really frightening. And um, if you do come across it, it will, as I say, usually be mid-facial fractures. Uh, it'll be a high-speed type trauma, so it'll be an MVA, etc. cetera. Um, and really, the, probably the best thing to do is to try and reduce the fractures. So often, if the mid-face is loose, you want to bring it forward and, and really hold it in place and you can do I mean usually the face the, the mid face will be loose and you can you can do that just by digital pressure nasal packing is is really important because often that's where the bleeding's coming from and uh, and um, you know unfortunately it's not kind of within the the time frame allowed here to, to go through that but but there are some good techniques to do that topical adrenaline is very helpful so once you've packed the nose you can squirt adrenaline directly onto your dressings and, and hope that that will help um, in the textbooks, you'll see facial compression bandaging, and you'll see these pictures of you know bandages everywhere and like, like a mummy type bandaging. Of course, airway is an issue then, so that's really um, that's really a case where you've already got airway control, but that can be helpful in the really desperate situation. And then once you get to hospital level care, then um, blood and coagulation factors, we um, we can um, tie off the external carotid, the the superficial temporals, but even then, uh, that's not usually particularly helpful and. And um, radiologists are our best friends in those situations to embolize the vessels. So. But those first three <coughs> factors probably for you guys would be, would be the most relevant ones. Okay, so uh, so then what do you, uh, you know, so you've come across, so we're, we're moving on from the from the really emergency sort of situations, so we're moving on to the early care. So how do you make the diagnosis? So obviously, you know, uh, as with everything else, uh, you know, your good history and then your examination. You'll, you'll learn a lot from the visual inspection. So you'll see that the, the obviously you're looking for swelling, you're looking for bruising, you're looking for asymmetry, um, you're looking at the eyes, you're looking at the... Ma uh, the mandible and the dentition and lengthening of the face often can be quite a quite a um, an important sign of mid facial fractures um, and then you palpate the patient so uh, as I'm sure you guys know facial injuries don't tend to be particularly painful uh, not like other fractures so you can actually be reasonably firm with your um, you know with your palpation you know if you're if you're looking for orbital rim fractures you know you can often palpate quite you know, reasonably firmly, you can grab the mid face and see if it's loose, you know, mandible. Um, so facial fractures don't tend to be very pa painful and, um, and palpation can be really useful. The other thing that, that you'll pick up with palpation is uh, any uh, emphysema, so subcutaneous emphysema. And um, what do you see that with most typically? Orbital fractures, right? Yep. So you, you'll actually feel the crepitus under the skin. Uh, obviously, you want to check for anesthesia. So, you know the supraorbital nerve. If there's a fracture of the frontal sinus area, you'll 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 have supraorbital numbness. Infraorbital nerve is really important because zygoma and orbital uh, floor and and uh, any any sort of fractures in the mid face will give you infraorbital numbness. And obviously, the mental nerve uh, numbness is, is important. Um, stability. So that refers to just really literally grabbing the the mid face and and just moving it, wiggling it, the mandible. Um, and malocclusion, if the pa patient tells you that their teeth don't quite meet right, uh, that's, that's a, that's, they've got a fracture unless proven otherwise. So if the teeth don't feel right, there will be something going on, even if you can't see anything obvious. <coughs> okay, so what I'm going to do now is go through all these different zones and, and just give you really a few pointers on, on what to look for at, on each of them and and, um, and how to manage some of the you know, early stuff to do with each of these fractures. So we'll start with the upper third of the face. So conveniently, we talk about the upper third, which is obviously the frontal sinus and frontal bone, uh, the middle third, which Richard's already covered, so the orbits and the rim. And these include the nasoethmoid, uh, you know, the, the yellow and, and red segment there, and then the zygoma fractures, which are very common with, with sports-related uh, and, and you know, interpersonal violence-related injuries. And then mid-face is really usually very high-speed injury. The maxilla, you need a lot of force. Uh, and the mandible, as uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen. So starting with the frontal sinus uh, fractures, a as you guys all know, so um, I'll, I'll point to this uh, screen here. Uh, so the frontal sinuses drain into the ethmoids, which then drain into the nose. Uh, there, there are often two frontal sinuses, but, but not always. There, there can be uh, you know, more than one septa, or the septi can, can be um, um, you know, not developed, so there can be just one big frontal sinus. Uh, 
children don't have them, right? So children don't, their sinuses aren't developed, their, their frontal sinuses are not there, their maxillae are full of teeth, so they don't have a, a maxillary cavity. So they're really only developed at, you know, 10 to 15 years of age and pneumatized at that age. So children are very vulnerable to, to trauma up here because it'll give them a brain injury rather than a, 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 a frontal sinus fracture. Um, and how we treat them depends on, on, you know, whether it's just the front wall or the back wall. This was actually a patient just from a couple of weeks ago that, that I was involved with, with the neurosurgeons who had high-speed trauma. So as you can see, frontal bone, uh, supraorbital rim, um, and, uh, you know, that's quite a high-speed serious fracture, uh, which we had to, to plate. And, and um, anyone know what that funny-looking thing is? Uh, extraventricular drain, so the neurosurgeons put that in for, for uh, raised pressure. So, so obviously that sort of thing is not subtle, but this sort of thing can be. So this is a, a very typical rugby injury, in fact that's, that's what his injury was, so it's a knee to the forehead um, and just really stoving in the, the frontal sinus. So you can see on the CT reconstruction that, that you know, the front wall of the sinus is stoved and it's got a nasal fracture as well. Um, and you know this is this happened on a Saturday. You know he comes on the Monday. I'm always on call on a Monday at Middlemore. So uh, right now somewhere in Auckland there will be something happening that you know we'll get to see on Monday. So uh, so this is a classic sort of Monday morning presentation. Um, so these ones, uh, you know, they're not. You don't need to be particularly excited or worried about them. They're, they're, we can see them at. at um, you know, we usually see them once the swelling settled, and then decide whether they need. Um, you know, an early treatment uh, if the dent, dent is quite big or we might leave it and then deal with it secondarily with some on-lay sort of bone putty type, type procedure. But, but this would be a typical sporting injury. You can see on the side view that the front wall is, is broken, the back wall is intact, so, um, so it really is just one wall. So what we do, it, it, it doesn't really matter from, you guys, from your point of view, but if it's just the front wall, it's a cosmetic issue. If it's both walls, then obviously then, then it's uh, communication to the brain potentially and, and um, it's a little bit more serious. I won't go through orbital trauma at all um, because that's already been beautifully covered by Richard. Uh, this would be, the, again, a typical Monday morning presentation, the raccoon eye periorbital hematoma, which is almost a, you know, a sign of orbital floor fracture uh, unless proven otherwise. And um, you probably don't, uh, I don't know if you guys still get x-rays or, or go to CTs. Uh, I think I've got a slide later on about radiology, but would you agree, Richard, that, um, that x-rays are probably, if you, if you have a high enough suspicion, you should move straight to CT, and, and certainly if someone presents with that, you know, that's what we'd do. But you can see the, the, the soft tissue, and you can see the fluid level there. Okay, I'm just going to move on uh, from these. Uh, the nasoethmoid fractures are a little bit more involved, so they're really, uh, think of it as a really bad nasal fracture where the whole uh, nasal bones, the ethmoid sinuses and the medial orbital walls are all totally stoved in. So um, these are quite important for us because if they're not treated well and not treated early, you can have a lot of secondary problems with you know, widening of the orbits, etc. that can be very difficult to, to treat. But from your point of view, what you'll see is you'll see, and I've got a picture after this, uh, but this is a typical one where it's basically been stoved in and blown out. And you get a flat, saddled nose, uh, you get widening telecanthus, widening of the nasal bridge, and you may get some CSF rhinorrhea, uh, so clear fluid coming out of the nose, uh, which, in, which in the setting of trauma obviously has to be considered to be CSF, again, unless proven otherwise. You may get diplopia. Uh, so this is the typical thing. So you see his nose has been pushed in, it's, it's, a, it's you know, foreshortened. This is not just a nasal fracture. So, um, you know, this is not the guy that you want to send home and get him back, you know, in a few days to, to see how the swelling's going. Uh, it requires, you know, a bicoronal approach and, and quite a lot of um, plating and manipulation. Yeah, on the side view, you can appreciate the, the saddle nose and the foreshortening uh, really well. Uh, probably one of the most common fractures we deal with are the zygoma fractures. So this the zygoma is probably the most prominent bone apart from the nose uh, on the face. So you know, and it, it seems to catch right onto the you know fourth and fifth knuckle as the as the assailant's fist comes. To, it's always, of course, the, the non-guilty guy that presents with uh, you know with the the, the zygoma fracture. Uh, 
Uh, we never see the guilty parties at Middlemore. Uh, they must go to Auckland, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, the zygoma is a prominent bone. It, it stoves in and um, breaks reasonably easily. And um, often you'll feel a step uh, in the infraorbital rim or maybe even up there in the, in the zygomatic frontal suture. You'll get some bruising and swelling around the eye. You'll get quite often infraorbital numbness because the nerve comes out through the floor of the orbit and out there and often the fracture runs through there. And you will see, of course you won't see it immediately because there's swelling, but if, if a few days later you will see some flattening of the cheek as well. Um, sometimes there can be impaired mouth opening. So if the, if the zygoma is really pushed in, uh, they'll have trismus, so they can't open their mouth. Um, and I'll show you why on the scan. Uh, so this is, this is what the patient looks like on the table just before we start to operate. So I don't know, hopefully you can make out that that cheek's quite flat compared to this side. He's lost the volume. And on the x-ray, this is the normal zygomatic arch in the zygoma. And this is the broken side. So you can see it's totally stoved in. And the coronoid process of the, maxilla, of the mandible is just there. Uh, you can see it on this side. So there's really not a lot of room there. So when the zygoma has been pushed in, often mouth opening can be quite painful. This is one of the unusual situations in facial trauma where they'll present with pain and, and trismus. And that's what the CT looks like. So there's the zygoma. So that's the normal side, obviously. The abnormal side's been totally stoved in. Uh, he's got a multi-fragmented uh, fracture, and it actually goes into the TMJ as well. And, and the plating uh, is usually, uh, you know, open reduction, internal fixation, very sort of orthopedic approach to, to life. Okay. The maxillary fractures are a different kettle of fish. Uh, you probably won't see a lot of them. Uh, we don't. Uh, they tend to be very high-speed trauma. And I think in this day and age of, uh, you know, seat belts and, and um, um, the, uh, the name skip. Air, airbags, thank you. I was going to say the balloons. Uh, you know, we don't see, tend to see these, but my, my um, uh, you know, previous bosses uh, used to see a lot of these and used to treat a lot of these, you know, face against the steering wheel. Um, so they tend to be, you have to, you know, have a very high speed type of injury to, to get these. But what you will see, uh, um, I think we'll come to it on the next slide, you, you will have come across this, uh, the Lefort fracture uh, sort of idea. And um, so Lefort was a French, French surgeon uh, in the early 1900s who, who uh, you know, took to cadavers with a hammer and then dissected them and worked out what fracture patterns were very common. So, um, you know, sort of, uh, I've heard various stories that it was a hammer versus um, him throwing the skulls out the window and seeing what happens. On, I don't know which one's true. Um, but anyway, so, so they're not always as classic as the Lefort fractures, but Often you'll get, uh, the most common is probably the Lefort 1, so right across the maxilla, and that's where you get the loose, loose face. And then Lefort 2 goes through the orbits, and Lefort 3 uh, sort of goes across here, and that's called the craniofacial disjunction. So really the face separates from the, from the skull. That's where you get those elongated faces and um, quite unusual looking, looking faces. Uh, but usually it's not a simple 1, 2, or 3. It's usually a combination of... of uh, one on one side and a three on the other side. So there you can see them pictorially. So number one, two is through the orbits and, and three is the sort of across the uh, craniofacial junction. Uh, so you will get periorbital hematomas. Uh, you'll get, nas this is the, these are the ones where you get the severe nasopharyngeal bleeding. And if you really have a loose maxilla, you know, you, 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 you it's life or death really. And, and if it's blood's welling up, you want to, pull it out, reduce it, and then, um, you know, try and pack the nose, uh, try and control the airway. Uh, they'll often talk about, present with malocclusion, so they say that their teeth don't fit. Often the, at the front they can't quite bite. Uh, there will be usually intraoral lacerations, so if you have a look in the mouth you'll see bruising or lacerations. Um, and the symptoms otherwise of the, of the zygoma, and obviously, you know, because it's the same bones, nasoethmoid type symptoms that we've already talked about. Clinically, you'll, you'll get mobility of the maxillary dental arch, and you may get uh, CSF right in the rear, and you'll see pneumocephalus uh, potentially on the CT if it's, um, if it's a high, high injury. So as I say, hopefully you won't 
you know, these are unlikely that you'll come across because there'll usually be trauma calls that'll go directly to hospital, but, but you may be a first responder and, and bleeding and airway will obviously be the, the most important things to, to control. Uh, so mandibular fracture, I'm no expert at mandibular fractures, but we do, we do uh, treat some of them with our maxillofacial colleagues uh, when there's other injuries and they're treating the mandibles. So just to tell you that um, it's very important whether it's a low speed or a high speed type injury, high energy, low energy. So, uh, you know, often with a high energy injury, you'll get um, multi-fragment mandibular fractures that are very unstable and that's where you'll get airway problems. Low speed injuries, sporting and um, you know unsporting injuries are, um, are much uh, you know obviously much more common that we all see. But again, same principles: A, B, C. So airway, obviously, being the most important, um, they'll often have associated dental injuries, which probably is important to document just for their sake of getting you know ACC treatment later on. Otherwise, if it's not documented, they won't get it. Uh, importantly, the the fractures tend to be multiple, so you don't. Very rarely do you get a single mandibular fracture. You'll often get a, a coup, contra coup type pattern, so one on one side and the other. And these are the most common ones. So the condyle is the most common. Uh, so up here, because you can see why, because it's such a thin portion of bone. So uh, if someone comes with a condylar fracture, you may not see it uh, on an x-ray. Uh, you probably won't see it on an x-ray, but they'll tell you their teeth don't fit, because you can imagine if one side's a bit out, then you know it'll affect the bite. So, so that's probably the most important sign or, or symptom that they'll they'll t talk about. They'll malocclusion. They'll have trismus, so they'll have trouble uh, opening the mouth. And often, a lot of people that have a you know direct trauma to the chin will have a, a lot of trismus anyway, and they'll complain of TMJ pain. And so, um, you know, you'll you'll need to you'll need to be thinking about the condylar fractures. Uh, the next most common is the angle fracture. Um, because uh, particularly if they've, they're missing their, their third molar, so obviously that tends to be a bit weak. And then, you know, uh, a variety of other fractures, uh, parasympathial fracture on one side and an angle on the other, for example, would be quite a common pattern that goes together. Uh, so they'll, talk, they'll, they'll tell you that their teeth don't fit. Uh, they may have some uh, mental nerve numbness on the lower lip. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you they've got loose teeth. Um, but it's usually not loose teeth, it's because the fractures are mobile, so that when they bite, you know, things kind of move and, and it, it's interpreted as loose teeth, even if the teeth aren't loose. Um, they'll, they might have an open bite so the teeth don't meet, and if you have a look in the mandible, you'll see bruising underneath the uh, mucosa. Okay, so, um, and, and probably the, the most common injuries that, that uh, all of us would see, you guys and us, would be nasal trauma. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because I think uh, nasal trauma, if it's treated well, um, you know, they usually have a, have a good outcome. And, and if they're not treated appropriately to start with, there can, there can be a very high incidence of, of long-term problems with, with airway and, and aesthetically as well. So. Uh, obviously, the, it's the most common uh, type of uh, facial injury. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, um, it's the most prominent feature on the nose, more so for some of us than, than others, and, um, you know, very at risk of getting, um, getting in the way. Uh, they're often thought of as uh, minor injuries, so, you know, the, we don't sort of tend to worry about them too much, but there's good literature to suggest that, you know, up to 50% incidence of post-traumatic nasal deformity for nasal fractures and that that includes uh, you know airway issues so you know they can have long-term consequences for patients so it's not just really just the aesthetics of it uh, the suboptimal aesthetic and functional results are, are contributed to by the fact that often they're delayed in presentation so people think they've just got a broken nose and you know, that they don't worry about it too much. Uh, often there's a lot of swelling precluding good examination and then they may not come back for a repeat exam uh, because things are feeling better. Uh, probably the most, most important reason from my point of view that why um, nasal fractures can do badly is, is that septal injuries are not recognized. Uh, that's both in primary care and even in hospital, uh, even our, you know, plastic surgery trainees, etc., may not necessarily be able to recognize a septal injury. So you have to have a high incidence of, a high suspicion for septal injuries. Uh, 
And obviously, the, the, you know, one of the things that complicates things, especially in sports people, is, uh, you know, they, they will say, well, you know, do you, you ask them, is, was your nose bent before, you know, how badly was it bent? Well, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I've had a few punches and, you know, a few rugby injuries. So it's very hard, isn't it? You know, uh, I, I often ask them to, to get out their driver's license and, and, you know, see if we can make out what their nose looked like. That's obviously just the AP view, but photos can be helpful. Um, and then obviously how much pain and, uh, you know, swelling and ecchymosis they have, you know, can give you another clue. But, but you're not going to be able to shift a pre-existing injury. So just if we have a look at the anatomy of the nose for, uh, for a little bit, uh, you'll, you'll notice that the, the, if you have a feel of your own nose, you'll see the top part is bone. And then if you, if you keep moving down, then you start to wiggle the, the cartilage around. So when you go home, have a feel of your kids' noses, you'll find that uh, it's mostly bone and very little cartilage. So the bone comes out a lot lower than, than adults. So kids' noses are mostly bony, cartilage is much smaller, adults much more, much, it's an older blue stuff is cartilage. Um, and the significance of that is, and that's why, for example, kids don't have humps on their noses, right? Be because the, the cartilage hasn't grown yet. You often develop a nasal hump when you're, you know, in your teens and as you grow, that's when cartilage really grows. So that's when you get a nasal hump. So for us, for adults, um, nasal trauma is often cartilaginous, which actually is much more difficult to deal with. Kids, it often tends to be uh, bony, which is, which is generally better. Uh, so the, the, the cartilages are very, you know, fairly soft and, and not particularly strong. Uh, on the sides and then obviously there's a septal cartilage in the middle which is a little bit more um, substance to it. So this is a view of the septum. So the nasal bone right up here, the, the purple, and then there's this big purple, light purple colour here which is called the quadrangular cartilage which is the main cartilage in the septum. Um, and then the rest is usually bony. So the ethmoid, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the voma, these are both bony parts of the septum. So the front part is cartilaginous and then bony. Okay, so these are the things that are really important to ask about and, and document. So you want to know about the mechanism obviously. Was it high speed? Was it low speed? What actually happened? Sometimes uh, they'll, you'll, you know, they'll tell you the punch came from you know one direction or they're not really sure. You know there were three guys and I was just minding my own business. Um, you know and um, and timing is really important. So when did it happen? Was it just this morning? Um, you know, was it last night? Was it five days ago? So that's really quite quite key. Uh, was there epis or was there or is there epistaxis? Epistaxis. So if there's no epistaxis, it's very unlikely that there's there was a significant trauma. Um, so they might have a bit of bruising, but it's yeah unlikely that there's significant trauma. Usually epistaxis is the is um, is quite quite an important feature. And, and then as we talked about nasal history and pre-existing shape of the nose, so you may get some clues from their driver's license or if they carry their passport or, um, or their, their wife or mother sitting in the room. Actually mothers are not reliable, mothers think their boys are perfect. Um, and then the exam. Uh, obviously, you look at the nose externally, so looking for swelling and, and ecchymosis. Um, have a feel of the nose uh, and, and crepitus. You know, can you feel the bones moving? So you'll feel crepitus on the bony part. You, you won't feel it quite so well on the, on the cartilaginous part. Um, I think it's really key to do a very good internal examination. Now, you don't have to use the topical anesthesia. Do you guys have the spray? The, yep, yeah, most of you would have it. So I would highly recommend anyone with a nasal injury, give them a couple of squirts of, up, up each nose and then have a really good look with, a, uh, with an instrument in there. The best instrument is this one here, the Killian uh, speculum, or, or some version of that. Would you guys have something like that in your practice? Um, some of you are nodding, that they're, you know, fairly inexpensive and, um, you know, um, just give you good access uh, to have a look in the nose. So, so looking at the septum with good lighting and a good instrument, uh, you know, is, is absolutely key to making a good diagnosis. So you're looking for, you're looking for septal injury. So you're looking for mucosal tears. Uh, so you'll, you'll be able to see that obviously. And obviously you're looking for septal hematoma. And I've got a picture of that later. 
um, and and you know whether the septum's dislocated, it's bent. You know, it's actually it's not difficult to see that if you if you actually take the time to have a look. And the nose is numb, so they're not kind of wincing away. You have good lighting. You have a good good instrument. Um, okay, so you think someone's got a nasal fracture clinically and on history. Um, how many of you would get an X-ray? No, you do think they have a fracture. No compromised airway, no. No, okay. You guys have heard this talk before? No, so that's right. So nasal fractures, nasal x-rays are really pretty useless. Um, and I mean, people still get them, but, but really whether they're... Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis is the point I'm trying to make. So, um, you know, if the, often x-rays will be normal because you know, it'll be cartilaginous injury, and it's very hard to see these tiny little nasal bones. So, so you know, I would, if, if the history and exam point to a nasal fracture, I'd treat as such and refer as such. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly in hospital, we would never insist on x-rays, and it would never turn away a referral on that basis, and we wouldn't get x-rays. So when you have a look in the nose, this is what you'll see. So. Uh, with a low velocity injury on the left hand side, often, uh, you know, we talked about the quadrangular cartilage along the vomer. So you will have a disruption along that line quite often. So it'll be usually because it's a punch or, or a blow from one side, you know, the, the, the septum dislocates. So you'll actually be able to see that. You look in the nose, you see, um, you know, the airway is much bigger on one side, much smaller on the other, and, and you might actually even be able to see the step where it's come off. Uh, it might be along here or it might be along the bottom here. With a high-speed injury, uh, you know, it's much more of a direct, you know, um, uh, like a bomb and, you know, sort of thing. And, uh, you know, there'll be multiple fracture lines. And, again, you'll see some, some septal, uh, you'll see some mucosal tears. You'll, you'll be able to see some cracks, etc. cetera. So, uh, so there's a different pattern depending on the, on the speed of injury. Okay, so we've diagnosed a nasal injury, and then we're uh, trying to decide what we should do about it. So that really depends on, obviously, the, the, how bad the injury is. So for, for the type of patient that I'm talking about, you know, there's no other injuries. There's the, the otherwise stable. There's no ongoing bleeding. Obviously, um, you know, airway, et cetera, is fine. Um, in that case, how you treat it depends on the timing. So in fact, the very best time to treat a nasal injury is, uh, you know, immediately. So right there, if you're right there, and um, you know you see it happen or they present to you very early and the nose is clearly bent uh, I think it would be uh, well worthwhile just relocating the, the nose right there and then so it's very much like the you know the PIP joint dislocation you might see on the rugby field uh, you know and you're the first person there the best thing to do is just pull it back and you know put it back and um, shoulder etc all these sort of things so same I think same thing applies to the nose um, you know if you see the nose injury happen acutely you're seeing the acute deformity before kind of the, the pain and swelling and everything sets in, um, you know, you can just manually, digitally relocate the nose. Again, probably a lot of you guys have done an acute, you know, joint relocation on a finger or a shoulder or whatever. It feels very similar. It actually goes, feels like it goes back in really nicely. You're not fighting edema. Uh, you're not fighting swelling, so it's actually relatively easy. And you can see the result right there and then. Um, you know, you can sort of do it to, to the correct extent. But unfortunately, not, not many of us see those quite so early on because it usually happen the night before or, or on Saturday night and they're coming to see on Monday or Tuesday. So by then, there's a lot of swelling and bruising and, and um, you know, that being the situation, uh, you know, we do need to wait a few days. So at that stage, you'd, you'd make the referral perhaps um, and uh, we, would, we would wait, I would wait uh, around five to seven days usually. And, uh, and then see what the nose looks like. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of, there's the literature in support of uh, nasal manipulation, whether it's best done under a local anesthetic or whether it's done under a general anesthetic. Um, there's, you know, obviously local is a lot easier, uh, but, in, but with general anesthetic, you can do a much more thorough job and you can deal with the septum as well. So I personally tend to be a fan of general anesthesia for, for manipulation and for septal um, you know, assessment. But I, I, it doesn't really matter too much, but you do need to wait those few days. And a lot of patients that I would see are pediatric, so um, you know, obviously you have to be asleep. 
And most often the manipulation is with a closed technique, but very occasionally you would have to open and do an immediate manipulation. So these are, just to let you know, these are the type of instruments that we would use. So that's called an ash forcep. Um, but it doesn't have to be that, you know, um, you can just use a you know, blunt-ended metal instrument. The back end, back end of a scalpel works really well, uh, again, in that acute setting or, you know, um, if you carry a scalpel with you then um, you know, that, that often works well to lift the nose. Uh, we use this faucet, the Walsham faucet, for, septum, for the septum. Uh, if you are going to do something in your office, in the, in the emergency type of setting, you can do what we call a field block. Oh, well, there's two options for local. You can do a field block, so that's basically all around the nose, and specifically you want to cover the external nasal blocks, which is just local, just at the junction of the cartilage and the nose. That's where the external nasal nerves come out, so that, that gives you good uh, anesthesia. But obviously it doesn't work so well for the septum. You, you'll use your spray in the nose, but, but it's not ideal. But if, you, you know, if you're uh, in a rural setting and you don't have easy access to a hospital for referral, etc., I think it's very valid for you guys. To, I, you're not going to do any harm. You're not going to make it any worse. The, the injury's already happened. You'll, you'll hopefully reverse the injury to some extent and hopefully to a large extent. So I think if there's going to be a problem with referral and delay, then I think it's very reasonable for, for you guys to do it in the primary setting. Um, uh, you know, you, you reverse the vector of injury if you can work out what it was and, uh, you know, use your finger pressure and, and blunt instruments as, um, as I mentioned. So this is, uh, for septum, this is what, what uh, you know, we use an instrument like this just to relocate it back to where it should be. Uh, that's for the, for the bone to push, usually to push it out because it's usually been pushed in, and for the septum to relocate it back along to, um, you know, back onto the um, area where it should be. Very occasionally, um, maybe in about 5 to 10 percent of, of uh, nasal injuries, uh, I would open. Sorry, we're missing part of the slide there. Uh, where um, we would have to open it because we can't, we can't deal with it closed. The septum just won't stay. In those cases, uh, you know, we do a limited septoplasty procedure and relocate the septum back on. So the patients well you know, described in the literature that patients with a severe septal injury do much, much better with a good early repair rather than a delayed repair down the line in six months' time. It's much more difficult to deal with a chronically bent septum, um, you know, from an airway point of view. It's never quite as ideal. Uh, so there is a little bit of common sort of wisdom out there that, you know, noses, you kind of leave them and see how they go and do a rhinoplasty later if required. But, you know, I think... Um, I think you get a much better result early on. So this would be an example of an acute nasal injury. This was a sport, sports injury, a hockey injury uh, from the stick. So you can see the acute deformity, you can see the acute hump that's formed, and if you have a look in his nose, you'll see a C-shaped curve um, you know, to the septum. And so this was just digital manipulation. Uh, and you can see, you know, because it was an acute injury, it was acutely bent. Um, you know, it's very easy to digitally manipulate it back into the back into the normal position. Uh, that's the lower view. You can see the septum. That's you know. Um, so uh, this is a quite a good view to you know. You can see the septum is, is in that nostril. It's been re dislocated off the midline and it's poking out into the right nostril, and it's back where it should be there. This is an acute on chronic type presentation. So this guy, you know, he says, oh, I'm not sure my nose was never quite straight anyway, but it's, I think it's got worse. And you have a feel of it, and it's a bit sore, but perhaps not as sore as you'd think it would be based on that degree of curvature. So we tried manipulating it. It didn't really go anywhere, and he needed a secondary procedure down the line. Okay, and this is, uh, of course, in all the textbooks, so I have to put it in, um, but it's something that you'd see as part of your good examination. So the, the sort of uh, emergency, if you like, as far as noses are uh, concerned, is a septal hematoma. So that's basically, uh, you know, there's the, the septum there, and each side of the septum is covered with some mucosa, and if you get a bleed, and, and the only reason you get a bleed is because there's a fracture, right? Uh, so um, if you get a bleed under there, that can then get infected and lead to septal necrosis, and um, you know then you can end up with quite a quite a severe problem. So, uh, and this is a very um, very obvious 
case, but they're not always quite as, as obvious as that. Sorry, that's a little bit, a little bit gross, isn't it? But, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not quite as obvious. But if you have a good look in the nose with good lighting, you'll see these. And if you see them and you're not in a position to refer them immediately, what would you do? Sorry, I'll pick on you because you're, you're looking very attentive. <laughs> right, great. Yep, so, so aspiration's probably not going to be very helpful. Okay, so obviously you'd, you'd spray it with some, um, co, you know, cofenyl can, whatever you have, and, um, and uh, you know, you, aspiration is not going to help because usually it's going to be clotted anyway. Um, so you might put a bit of local in and then just make, an, make a cut directly over it and use a cotton bud to just roll it all out. And you want to leave that, you know, you don't want to stitch that mucosa again, so just leave it open to drain because they'll recollect again. That's very good. Um, yes? Well, yes, so, um, yeah, so after that, then, yes, I think that would be a good idea. Yep, so you'd, you'd use one of those nasal tampons, the Mirosel packs, to, to pack the nose. Yep. Yes? I beg your pardon? Well, if it's only on one side, then yes, you would only cut it on one, like, like that picture there. Uh, yeah, that's probably the most common ones uh, would, be, would be a one-sided one. But if it's on both sides, then you, there's no harm in doing both sides. You want to be um, aggressive about it. And again, if you don't have the opportunity to refer them to a hospital, uh, you'd want to see them the next day uh, and take the packing out and just have a look and make sure it hasn't recollected again because they have a nasty habit of re reforming. Okay, so as far as nasal injuries are concerned, uh, the diagnosis is based on history and exam, not, not on radiology. Um, you want to uh, assess it in five to seven days when swelling subsides. I think the septum is absolutely the key to managing these well long term. And uh, obviously we always tell patients that there may be need for further surgery down the line, but I think if they're managed well immediately, that, that <laughs> tends to reduce that risk. And um, Sorry, this is not a face, but uh, what's going on there? It's an arm, obviously. The patient's going to have surgery. Yeah, a, a nasty gravel rash. So, but um, I couldn't find a facial picture, but I don't know why, because I've seen quite a few of these now. But, uh, you know, the, the classic, you know, come off your bike or, or something and you get gravel on, on, on the face. And this was a, that situation and it just was never cleaned properly. And, um, you know, if you end up with that, oops, sorry, if you end up with that on the face, um, you know, it's very difficult to deal with secondarily. So these are really important to clean properly and, and get all the gravel out. And again, I, I would, um, you know, if you can't, I would refer them to hospital for, for having that done. Because in, in a situation like this, once it's established, you're really then down to surgical excision and um, uh, she was going to have some tissue expanders put in to do that. So, so if you see the, the, you know, the nasty gravel rashes, I think it's really important to, uh, to make sure that it's completely clean or referred for that purpose. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't have a watch, but um, uh, how much time have we got, Dave? Uh, okay, so we've got a few minutes. Um, so if, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, Richard Hart's uh, still here as well in terms of orbital. Oh, so one question, I'll just open the floor with my first question. Um, uh, Richard and I were talking about uh, prophylactic antibiotics for facial fractures, so particularly in regards to orbital fractures. How many of you guys would give prophylactic antibiotics if they've got a, f uh, yep, orbital fracture? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, some of you, 60% or so. Okay. Um, uh, well, well, Richard and I were talking about it, and we were saying that we both do it as well. Um, I don't know that there's any necessarily good science behind it, except that in theory, you know, it's an open uh, compound fracture, you know, sinus bugs, etc. But obviously the most important thing is to tell them not to blow their nose because then they get that emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema. And what about mandibular fractures uh, or maxillary fractures for that matter? What would you um, suggest? Antibiotics? Uh, well, a, a mandibular fracture. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a condyle, very good. So if it's a condyle, that's not an open fracture, so you don't need injury. But if it's on a tooth-bearing part of the mandible, uh, then in theory, again, it's a compound fracture, and the, the you know the maxillofacial guys would 
generally suggest antibiotics. Yeah. Okay, any questions, please? Yes. Yep. Okay, very good. So the question is, you know, getting your head around when do you x-ray, when do you just refer, or um, when would you get a CT, when would you go straight to CT? Who, who would have the ability to order a CT sort of early? Okay, so some of you guys do. Yep. Um, so that's a very good question. So it's easy for us to say go straight to CT, but I mean, you guys don't have that luxury. Uh, I think, I think if you've got high clinical suspicion of a facial fracture, an orbital fracture based on those signs or a zygomatic fracture or a you know, frontal sinus fracture, then I think you, know, you have to treat it as a fracture. So probably most people would still get an x-ray because it's sort of thought to be good practice, but, um, but you would still want to refer either way. So you're not going to, you certainly wouldn't be criticised for not getting an x-ray, sorry, for getting an x-ray. But I think if there's good signs and if someone presents to a hospital who hasn't already had an x-ray, then we would just go straight to CT. Does that answer your question? So, so what I'm saying is go ahead and do it, you're not going to be criticised for doing it, but if the x-ray doesn't show anything obvious but you've got a high suspicion that something's going on, then you would still want to treat it as such. Yeah, Richard, would you like to answer that question? That's a perfect question for you. <laughs> no, that's good. That's great. <coughs> Come up here, Richard, and, um, yep. Just saying I would echo what Zach has said, and that's clinical suspicion. So if you suspect that there's something that's not quite right about that patient, you see a lot of people with soft tissue contusions from blunt trauma, but you don't image everybody. But if you've got somebody who's complaining of more pain than usual, or they've got pain on eye movements, or double vision, or if they've got numbness, as you mm. mentioned in your talk, Zach, around the infraorbital nerve distribution, all of those sorts of symptoms and signs would tend to, it, it's an equation, isn't it? You add everything up and then you make a decision about imaging. So there, I don't think there are, well, I mean, there are certainly some hard and fast rules that, that if someone's got double vision and their eye is displaced, they've got hypoglobus or anophthalmus, those patients should be imaged. Um, but but for, the, for the people who've got softer symptoms and signs, it can be very difficult. But if you've got a high suspicion that there might be a fracture, as Zach was saying before, I don't think you'd be criticised for imaging if you've got access to CT, or if not, then refer. Yes. I want to answer that one. Yeah. So the sensitivity <laughs> of uh, plane films for orbital fractures is 50%. So it's 50% wrong, it's 40% false positives, and so it's worse than useless. But you can do one if you want to. Um, the sensitivity of plane radiographs for mandible fractures is also 50%. So you need a CT or a Panorex. So if you know there is clinical suspicion for a fracture, you must do an image that answers the question. So if, the, if they've got teeth that don't match, you've got to find a Panorex or a CT. You can do your plain films, but you can't rely on them to rule it in, and you can't rely on it to rule it out. So one of the ones that I read that was a really good blog recently is take a coin out of your pocket and toss it and rely on the answer from the coin. I think that's quite definitive, yes. <laughs> right. I just want to comment on that is that the radiologists do not want to do CT scans on children with anything other than the fracture and the fracture is not Yes, yes. So children and young people, absolutely. So there's good evidence to show, uh, you know, for example, with our craniofacial patients, we're very careful about not over CTing them. There's quite a heavy dose of radiation, etc. So on children, we'd have to, uh, we wouldn't x ray them for the same reason either. We'd, we'd, we'd have a high suspicion first. Yes. 
numbness. Yeah, it is. So give me a scenario. Oh, well, just exactly that. One, you know, one trauma to the, to the eye. Yes. A bit of a subconscious type of hemorrhage. Yes. Scrubbing around and the eye. Yeah. Everything is tender. But you're not getting any hard signs. Right. You might not have any with it. Because it's a low-out pressure. We know that our pain radiology doesn't tell it, doesn't rule it out. Yes. Is that just serial examination? Yep. I think serial examination would be reasonable. There's still an incidence of... Uh, ocular trauma like high femur or, or something like that going on so you'd probably still want to see those patients Richard if they've got a subconjunct hematoma that's big. I'd, I'd agree with that in that situation you'd follow up the patient but if perhaps you picked up that the vision was slightly depressed then you'd want to have a look with a slit lamp if you've got access to it or refer yes yeah if it's a bit blurry and, uh, you know, yeah, so I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly not much, probably, ser em uh, you know, emergency stuff's going on, so you could, you could just see them in a couple of days. I think serial examination would be the way to go. Yeah. Great. Tummy's rumbling, afternoon tea. Some of you guys will be going to Adele tonight. <laughs> I won't give you a rendition of my uh, Adele songs. All right, thanks for your attention, guys. And um, feel free to contact either of us if you have any questions or we'll be here.